Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be looking at social interactionist theories of delinquency. And again, to break down the sociological theories, we generally have our three uh, major theories in sociology, our macro theories like functionalism and conflict theory, and then you have your micro theories like symbolic interactionism. And it's kind of debatable whether or not conflict theory would be more macro or micro. And again, even symbolic interactionism can be taken on the micro because, again, what makes up these large groups, what makes up these large institutions is individuals. Um, but again, sociology in itself has had to kind of reconcile with the difference between sociology and psychology or really the frame of reference or unit of analysis even or however words you want to apply it. Sociology has always historically been the macro science, the big picture approach to studying the social world. But over time, we've realized that we also need to understand how individuals interact with these groups and how the groups themselves structure the individuals. And so it became much more complex. We had to get down from not just groups, but also down to the individual level. And we can always come at things from a macro perspective, but again, you have that blend, which is like social psychology or the triples like biopsychosociology or biosociology or biopsychology. And, you know, we have all these different ways of combining things into one. Um, but again, the first lecture we did, we were looking at functionalist theories. We're looking at how systems and structures are associated with juvenile delinquency. Looking at macrocosmic uh, constructs like the family, the criminal justice system, the neighborhood you live in, region, socioeconomic status, big picture concepts like race and gender. All of this, which you know we might be able to combine into a functionalist way. But for this next lecture, we're going to look at conflict theory, which is going to be looking at how groups compete for resources and how that results in inequality. And then again, that inequality dictates where you're located in the socioeconomic status, which dictates your things to like access to life chances, opportunities, good education, you know, getting out of poverty, which can be associated with crime. And then we're also going to be looking at, again, these individual level theories, individual level causes, like psychological theories that are blended in. Um, and so we'll get down to the small in this lecture. And again, the last one was really focusing on the big. But to delve in, first we're looking at labeling theory. And again, I kind of like to look at this through the looking glass self of, you know, Cooley as the idea that how you perceive yourself is associated with how you think others you know whether it's significant people in your life or society at large view you and then you internalize the perceptions or you internalize you know your perception of what you think other people think about you so for example negative stigmas okay do people internalize negative stigmas and that does that affect us or self-handicapping theory in psychology if you tell somebody they're going to do terrible at this test ahead of time and you label it like that then they tend to throw the test but if you tell them you're going to do great they tend to do great so again if you know how much do people internalize labels of society and so your book describes it as society creates deviance by branding those who are apprehended as different. And again, we label those that deviate from the social norms. And if you deviate from social norms, what do we call you? We stigmatize you with these words, with these labels, and specifically regarding juvenile delinquency, we can label, you know, as one, a delinquent. You know, where does the labeling of being a delinquent come from? So what happens if a kid like is having problems at home and all of a sudden they're skipping school and now that they skip school, they get picked up for unruliness or some charge like that. Then they get labeled a criminal. Does that end up having future effects on them? What if they start believing that and then they decide, you know, the heck with it. What's the point? Why not go be a criminal? And so again, labeling theory focuses upon the processes by which individuals become involved in deviant behavior and stress the part played by social audiences and their responses to norm violations of individuals. So again, what do we do when kids commit crimes? Do we just label them and punish them? Or do we apply maybe positive reinforcement or 
you know, some way of teaching them the proper behavior so that they can follow the social norms. And again, remember, all social norms are socially constructed. We're the ones who institutionalize these cultural norms. And then we enforce these norms through things like sanctions and social control. So again, formal and informal social reactions to criminality can influence criminals' subsequent attitudes and behaviors. So if we're looking at things like recidivism, does the likelihood of committing crimes increase after somebody has committed one crime? Yes. Why? Is it because we then label them a criminal, put them in the institution, expose them to that culture of poverty? Once they get that label, it might be hard for them to get a job, whatever it might be. Maybe they got kicked out of school. They don't have a good chance to get a better education. So even after they're like 18 and moving on in their life, you know, they didn't go to good schools, were in and out of juvenile delinquents, you know, centers, and, you know, how does that affect their overall outcomes in life? And so these are the questions we should be asking. So again, labeling theory focuses on the processes by which formal social control agents change the self-concept of individuals through these agents' reactions to their behavior. So again, it's that looking glass self. How you think other people feel about you influences how you feel about yourself. And then if you get socially labeled, like what happens when you call a kid a nerd in school? It's the same thing. It gets into your head. What happens when you make fun of someone? It gets into that kid's head. That's why we always should treat our kids and not make fun of people. Because again, it gets into our heads. And then once it's into our heads, it's hard to kick out. And then think about stigmas along lines of like gender. Like there are stigmas against women that exist in the world. Do you honestly think women haven't heard the stigmas too? You think they haven't internalized some of the negative biases that exist about women? Same thing goes for race. You think that someone who identifies as black hasn't internalized negative stereotypes and that might affect their decision making? Does that account for why black males, for example, are more likely within race to commit crimes than someone is white, for example? Is it because the effects of racism and social stigma and blocking someone from gaining socioeconomic status, all of these things affect their psychological, the psychological decisions of what they're going to do? It does, okay? So labeling theory. The process of making the criminal, therefore, is a process of tagging, defining, identifying, segregating, describing, emphasizing, making conscious and self-conscious. It becomes a way of stimulating, suggesting, emphasizing, and evoking the very traits that are complained of. Again, if you speak that into somebody's life, do they end up fulfilling that role? Okay. The book talks about primary and secondary deviance. Again, it's looking at the causes. Primary deviance would be individual's behavior, and then secondary deviance would be society's response to that behavior. Your book gets pretty deep into this idea about how does society react to individuals, and it's that response to individuals that can be associated with continuing deviant behavior. So again, the general assumptions of labeling theory is there's a variety of causes or influence of crime. Um, Eventually, they commit crimes, they get labeled as a deviant, that then affects their self-image, which then increases the likely they'll continue to engage in deviance behavior in the future. So again, we should always be thinking not only about the primary causes of deviance, what's going on in somebody's mind, what's going on in their social context that led them to make these decisions to deviate from social norms and maybe commit crimes or whatever it might be, and then we need to be thinking about the social responses. How do we go about managing society in forms of social control? Which is going to come up in a couple slides here in a second. So I'll wait to hold off on that. Okay. Um, but again, once a person is caught and labeled, that person becomes an outsider and gains a new social status. If you get deep into stigma theory and you look at Goffman's theory of stigma and how that stigma creates anxiety and how we stigmatize people based upon things like physical deformities, racial and ethnic status, and then other forms of statuses. You know, you can kind of see that once you get labeled, they, he uses the word normals. Like if you're labeled as not one of the normals, 
or someone that conforms to the social norms or doesn't look the part or their body is not perfect or whatever it might be, then we then as a society tend to stigmatize people, okay? And so again, we're looking at these effects of stigma and then how does that get in people's heads? That's the general concept of labeling theory. Conflict theory, again, is going to look at how forms of inequality and social class location are associated with somebody committing a crime. Your book goes much deeper and starts getting into the whole philosophy of conflict theory about who do the police really work for? Do they work for the bourgeoisie? Again, the dominant culture in power gets to dictate the social norms. They're the ones who get to dictate the rules. And so again, those that don't have the power to dictate the rules you're then at the mercy of the bourgeoisie and the culture they make and the social control that they socially construct deep concepts but again we have social control in the form of criminal justice system whatever police prosecutors parents all to kind of maintain the status quo and so the book gets into the idea about social control as the end result of the differential distribution of economic and political power in any society. And conflict theories, theorists view laws as tools created by the powerful for their own benefit. Again, our laws maintain this system. We have laws that keep people from stealing. Does it exist to maintain the capitalist system? All of that is way too deep for this class. Again, take a nice sociological theories class and delve into that. But what we need to focus on is we live in a capitalist system in which power and resources are unequally distributed. And again, where you're located in this class system, think about your education level, your job prestige, your wealth, and then your social and cultural capital add all that up and then compare yourself to other people that's essentially how you figure out where you're located in the class system but again the idea is there are consequences to being in the lower classes for example the effects of poverty can be very great and detrimental on overall outcomes again your parents socioeconomic status is the number one thing associated with whether or not you're going to go to college and actually graduate and so how does your social location your socioeconomic status where you live the neighborhood you're exposed to how does that then translate to things like juvenile delinquency and your book starts getting into different forms of social control like what's your neighborhood like is there good policing do you have grandparents and parents all making sure the kids aren't just running the streets and doing what they want and selling a bunch of drugs? And so your book says each individual is a member of many groups, family groups, work groups, play groups, political groups, religious groups, and so on. And each one of these groups has its own particular conduct norms. And then who is enforcing these norms? And so when you get into these breakdowns of the lower classes versus the middle classes and up classes, you're going to see differential social norms. What's acceptable in one place might not be as acceptable in another place, for example. And so again, where does this idea of the culture of poverty come from? Well, again, look at the culture of lower class. When you look at the culture of lower class, and if you go deep into sociological theory of like Bordeaux and Habitus and how your social location or your socioeconomic status is then associated with the cultures that you get socialized into. And then again, each social class has its own cultural way of life. Then you start to see that is there a cultural way of life in the lower class that starts to yield an increased likelihood of committing crimes for juveniles. And you don't want to say that because that would that's kind of sad. But I mean, the world is not fair. Of course, where there's poverty, you're going to see more crime, more drug use. It's just kind of the way it breaks down. It doesn't hold up for alcohol, though. Alcohol is one of those you know, exceptions to those rules. When it comes to drug use, drug selling, common crimes like burglary, who's committing those crimes, it doesn't tend to be the rich and powerful out burglarizing houses and dealing drugs. Okay? So again, socioeconomic status, even if it doesn't directly correlate to that, is then associated with it all right so again we need to be thinking about things like the social context of delinquency b 
because we need to be thinking about not only the social context, such as being in poverty, being associated with committing crimes, but also the social context as having the institutions necessary to really focus on individuals and bring them back to society. So the book talks about ideas like anime. Again, once you get labeled as a criminal, do you get disconnected from society, from that larger culture? How can we reconnect people to society after they commit crimes? And so a little bit further on, we'll go deeper. But as you can see in each chapter, it keeps introducing these ideas like restorative justice. I've seen this come up several times over the chapters that we've had. But again, restorative justice is interesting because, again, it's all about how do we take these people that are not conforming to the social norms and encourage them in some way or set them up in some way that they can become part of the group again. And that is not to be taken in like a big brother way, like we shouldn't question authority, because again, sociology, you question everything all the time. But again, in order to have a predictable, stable society, again, we need to have some form of a status quo. We should be constantly challenging that status quo in a productive way to make sure that that status quo is still relative as society evolves across aeons, you know. So again, that whole philosophy aside, how do we bring people back into the fold? So again, this idea of reintegration is going to be coming up consistently throughout this class. Um, and so it's going to be framed along ideas of like restorative justice, community structures. How do we get people brought back into the fold, essentially? So that's just being introduced in this chapter. Um, your book has some contrib contributions of conflict perspective to social policy. A little bit later, again, we're going to go deeper into this in later chapters. And since we're just wrapping up these last two weeks in theories, I don't want to go too deep into these structures associated with restorative justice, social programs, um, different types of laws, drug courts, um, you know, just different approaches to how to manage or cope with juvenile delinquency so it doesn't end up becoming a massive social problem. Um, but again, um, what can we do? What kind of social policies can we implement? Again, how do we help youth achieve their maximum potential? How do we teach children's groups about power and domination and how that affects the creation of policy? That one is a little interesting. How do we talk about opportunity structures and economic exploitation as a way to end juvenile delinquency? Again, how can we look at the formal justice system and other informal systems that are associated with structuring juvenile delinquency? And so again, your book just introduces it in these two chapters. I'm keeping this lecture really short because again, I just wanted to kind of focus just mostly on just wrapping up our theories. Um, you know, so we've done just some macro theories. I gave you a giant list on that one. This one we're wrapping up, which is again, just introducing the idea of the individual a little bit here. Um, but again, thank you guys so much and have a wonderful day.